Javier Millet uh, declared himself to be a libertarian, and not only just a libertarian, but to be an anarcho-capitalist who sees the state as a gangster organization who regards taxation as theft and who wants to cut the state down to nothing. That was his declaration. That's his self-confessed program. He mentioned, especially before he got elected, as his sources of inspiration on number one, my teacher and mentor, Murray Rosebart, and also myself. So because of that, I feel entitled to make a few, make a few remarks about this guy who is supposedly, has been supposedly being inspired also by me. Okay. Um, his victory was indeed sensational, that he was elected with a program like this in Argentina. But as Tony has explained, the background was, yes, in Argentina you had hyperinflation, you had economic stagnation, uh, increasing impoverishment, um, and given this background and given his showman talent that he definitely has with a certain element of clownishness. Um, his victory had very little to do in my assessment with Argentinians understanding any of that. Argentines are just as stupid or as smart as Germans, Englishmen, Americans and so forth. All they wanted Catastrophe is there, we want some change, and this guy promised big change. No understanding. Um, now, following his victory were some interesting developments. There were huge celebrations uh, and jubilation among the libertarians everywhere. He was awarded one award in Spain, another award in Germany, another award in, uh, in the Czech Republic. And as a president that was elected, he of course received all sorts of invitations to famous organizations. He went to Davos and all sorts of other big time conferences. Um, and there he gave some um, fired up speeches before these elite public. Um, these people listened to his speeches, but you can be pretty sure that went into one ear and went out the other ear immediately. Um, among the libertarian peanut gallery, there were of course huge excitement about it. Did you ever imagine that a guy like this would give a speech like that before an elite public? There was, there was nothing special about the speeches. Speeches like that have been given thousands of times in, in better way by other people. The only difference was it was a different audience. Of course, they would never invite me to Davos to give a speech. Um, <laughs> We can wait for a long time before that happened. They never would have invited Rospart to give a speech like this. But of course, I could have given a speech like that easily too. I, Rospart could has given hundreds of speeches like this. And I will explain in a few minutes why I think the people listened to that by, but didn't really care much about what he said. Also, thinking back, I have not checked that. My impression was that in, during his campaign, he appeared more of an anti-statist, and during his speeches that he then gave as president, the emphasis was more on he's being an anti-socialist, not so much that he is an anti-statist. But I have not checked that. But there was a slight change in, in tone and emphasis. Um, the whole thing reminded me a little bit of the hoopla that you had when Obama uh, 
received the Nobel Prize before he even had any chance to go on killing people, murdering people, and so forth. Now, of course, this was in the opposite direction. But again, all the prizes were awarded before there was anything to show for. So in that sense, I thought there was a certain prevailing uh, parallel between the Obama phenomenon and the Milai phenomenon. So now there is obviously a time for evaluation. Now this evaluation that I will present is an evaluation that is from far away. I do not speak Spanish. I have been to Argentina years ago, but I'm not a, uh, a knowledgeable person about, um, about Argentina. Um, obviously, like all libertarians, I was excited about that whole thing. So great, wonderful, I wish him all success in, uh, in, his, in his endeavors. Um, but I was never, I never belonged to the cheerleaders in, in this group. F for that, I think I'm, I have been too long in this type of business. I have seen many big promises and then following huge, disappoint, huge disappointments. Um, and there were signs that I detected from the very beginning that made me quite skeptical and suspicious about Milai. I might talk about some of this thing a little bit later, what there's some sort of awkward things uh, went on there. Now, if we look at his accomplishments, first, internal affairs. Yes, he abolished rent controls and some other controls, but by no means all price controls. There are still price controls, for instance, for medical insurance. He liberalized the labor laws, um, and some subsidies were eliminated, but by no means all. Um, there were various deregulations passed, um, and also some privatizations occurred, but not all that many. Um, some politically correct ministries were closed, but a large part of the personnel was simply shifted to other, de to other departments. Yes, there was a certain number of people that were dismissed from public service, but by no means all. Many were just shifted from one, from one outfit um, to another outfit. Um, some taxes were lowered, but other taxes were raised, for instance, on fuel and on imports. And there were also some taxes even newly introduced. And remember, taxes are theft in, ter in terms of Millet. Um, government budget, yes, has shown a surplus, but the surplus has not led to a tax reduction. The surplus remains in the hand of the government, is further spent by the government. Um, the balancing of the budget was not only achieved by cutting expenditures, but it also was achieved by raising taxes. Okay. There was also no such thing as decentralization of power, which is a very important ingredient of, uh, of libertarian, the libertarian outlook. You give more power to the provinces, to the localities. No, his program is centralize the power uh, and limited the autonomy of the various provinces that exist in Argentina. Um, so the verdict for the internal policy, of my verdict would be that was all good, all nice, I'm all in favor of that, but that was hardly earth-shattering uh, reforms, more in the line of, let's say, Reagan or Thatcher, but in terms of the program of an anarcho-capitalist, no big deal. Then we come to monetary policy, that's even more important. No, Milai, promised that he would abolish the central bank. He realized that the greatest power that governments have is 
the monopoly power over the production of money. If they don't have that, then they would have to rely only on taxation. And if you have to rely only on taxation, then it is very difficult to get come up with the necessary money to do all the government spending. Now, remember also that Ron Paul, whose program in the United States was far less radical, at least as far as the uh, 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 talking was concerned, uh, he realized that we have to end the Fed. That's the most important program, end the Fed. No, the central bank is still in existence. Um, inflation is down, but annualized, as Tony said, is still 250% or something like, something like that. So this is an enormous inflation, even though cutting inflation is not all that difficult. You simply have to cut down, to close the central bank and print no more money, then you get the inflation down in a week. Um, so central bank is still there, inflation is down. In recent months, we have already seen, again, a rapid increase in the money supply. So the printing of money by the central bank goes on. Um, and in addition, which is hardly ever mentioned, massive amounts of gold were shipped out of the country and nobody knew exactly or explained in detail where that gold went and for what purpose the shipping of gold out of Argentina occurred. Um, no, Argentinians are among those people who have the highest per capita amounts of dollars on hand because of the high inflation in Argentina, people shifted from pesos into dollars. They did their calculation and their savings all occurred in dollars. Um, but n n normal, normally under hyperinflation, under inflationary conditions, a, the peso will simply disappear and the dollar will take over. That that did not occur, the reason was simply a price control as far as currencies are concerned. That is, if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to buy dollars with pesos, you had to pay a tax for it. If you wanted to sell dollars in order to pay your taxes in terms of pesos, you had to pay another tax for this. This, this regime of um, of currency price controls uh, is still in place um, because you are forced uh, because of legal tender laws um, to, you, you're forced to um, to pay your um, taxes in in terms of uh, of pesos and cannot avoid these uh, these currency controls that exist these currency controls are of course a terrible regime they, they, they hamper imports, they hamper exports, they distort the entire uh, economy. It would have been, this perfect solution has also been proposed by various people, I think by Mila himself, would have been dollarization. You simply say that the dollar and the peso compete on an even playing level. You can pay your taxes in dollars, you can pay your taxes in pesos, you can pay your taxes in terms of euros, you can pay your taxes in terms of, um, uh, in, 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 ter in terms of gold, but whatever, whatever you want. Um, you simply close the central bank, no more pesos will be printed, and you leave it to the market in what type of currency, people pay their taxes. Nothing like that happened. But he did say that he would do that very quickly. Now, instead, he still has a central bank, as we saw. Um, the peso is still in, yeah, in, in, in circulation next, next to the dollar with, with the price controls um, that, uh, that exist. 
And the trust in the existing central bank is of course not very high in Argentina. The personnel that he employs is basically the same that created the mess that he wanted to get out of. There's a Mr. Caputo was a former central banker, and then Mr. Sturzenegger was a former central banker. All of these people studied in the United States. All of them are Keynesians. Uh, all of them served at various big banks and do the normal crap that all of these people coming out of America do in wherever they are sent to fix, fix the economy of, uh, of other people. Um, so, as far as monetary affairs are concerned, that was also not a big deal. Yes, inflation is lower, but, but it's still higher than it is in Turkey. And, and, and Turkey is already a disaster in that regard. Um, so, no big deal that he achieved there. Much more could have, done, could have been done, and much faster. And there is no trust in the central bank with the history like the history of Argentina and the same people in charge, who would trust them for anything? Now, then the topic that has not been touched upon at all is the topic of uh, war and peace and foreign affairs. For Murray Rothbard, for the libertarians, that is the biggest of all questions, the question of war and peace. Any other topic diminishes in importance as compared with, are you in favor of war? Are you in favor of peace? Um, no, the traditional view of libertarians, again, represented, for instance, in this regard by uh, Ron Paul, for instance, is we take a position of a neutral country. We do not interfere in any other country's affairs. Um, and um, uh, we are aware of the fact that when we look at the world, we have to be revisionist historians. We know that we are told wrong history by our rulers. Now, Milai's worldview strikes me has about the same sophistication as that of an American high school graduate. Um, he is completely unaware of revisionist history. I doubt that he ever seriously studied Rothbard, even though he mentioned him frequently. Um, and because of that, he is not considered to be a threat by the elites. Because in foreign policy, he is just a, bra br uh, uh, a nice boy following, following along the the main lines, the indications. So first, he does go to the IMF, International Monetary Fund, uh, and instead of repudiating the debt, he now says, no, pacta sunt servanda, I have to be, I have to just pay up to the contracts that we made. But these are not contracts. The government bonds are paid back by taxing your own population. So this is not, you don't have to keep contracts like this. These are no contracts. So they should have simply said, stupid that you are, you bought all of these government bonds, you will not get repaid. There is also no obligation of the government to repay debt to its own central bank that, that creates money out of thin air. This has to be simply ignored. The central bank does no longer exist. You don't care about it. You don't pay any foreign debt whatsoever. Say, no. Rothbard's argument was, was, yeah, but what do people then, what will then happen? And his answer was, then nobody in the future will be as stupid again and ever buy government debt because they once realized it will not be repaid. That's it. Okay. Uh, that, of course, increased also the love for, of for Millet by the international elites. He is going to pay all his debts. 
Um, and then, in addition, there is some sort of love affair between melee and all the institutions that are responsible for all evil in the world. He loves the United States, and not and the United States, when I say the United States, I don't mean the American population, I mean the American government. So he aligns with the American government. The American government is the most imperialist country that exists, the most warlike country that exists, the country that causes trouble wherever it goes, that kills hundreds of thousands of people. So there is no more dangerous government in the world than the United States. If you simply count the people who were killed by various countries, the United States is definitely number one. So why would you just say, without any need, could just stay neutral? It's like, I don't care about foreign affairs. I just take care of Argentina. Why would you just love the United States? And why would you also love Trump? Um, he emphasized how great his admiration for Trump is. No, Trump is a buffoon. Trump is a narcissist. Trump is a protectionist. Trump is also a warrior. What, what, where do you think the weapons come from to, that, that go to uh, Ukraine and Israel and so forth? They come from the United States. Um, but he loves also Zelensky. He calls Zelensky a hero of freedom, gave him a medal. No, Zelensky is also a criminal clown who sacrifices the population of the Ukraine for a senseless war. Why does he dance in the streets with Netanyahu while Netanyahu is bombing Gaza to the ground, killing hundreds of thousands of people in the meantime. The most criminal person who currently ro roams around is Mr. Netanyahu, and he dances with him in the streets. Now, what type of reputation is this? Do we libertarians want to celebrate somebody as a hero who is a friend of the United States, who wants to also join NATO. Remember, you remember probably that Argentina is in the North Atlantic, because that's just, uh, he, he, bought, he bought a tremendous amount of airplanes from the United States. I'm sure that made him also many friends in the United States. He even sent some weapons to the Ukraine. And only recently he gave a speech where he said, our army has joined maneuvers with the United States in the South Atlantic. Um, and recently he gave a, gave a speech where he said, I want to just have more power given to the army. Salaries were increased for the, for the army personnel. And not only that, he said uh, the army should also in the future take on obligations internally. That is, they should be used to fight terrorism and drug dealing and things like this. So he wants to use the army against his own population, not against foreign aggressors attacking, uh, attacking Argentina. No country in, in a long, long time has ever tried to attack Argentina. So if I, again, I know many people compare him with, yeah, with some standard politician and say, oh, he's better than many others. And undoubtedly he is. I would prefer him too over many others. No question. I prefer Trump over Kamala, even though I think both are criminals. Um, and I would, of course, prefer Millet over many other people too. But from the point of view of a 
anarcho-capitalist, which he claims is his philosophical conviction, he is, of course, a disaster. And I cannot agree with making him, well, among libertarian circles, turning him into some sort of hero. He is not a hero. Okay, that should be, that is my, my personal view as somebody who has been mentioned by him as one of his inspirations and as somebody who knew Murray Rothbard probably better than anybody else who is currently alive. Um, and he was mentioned as his other major, well, his main inspiration. So from the point of view of a Rospardian and a Hoppian, no, Millet is not a hero. He is better than many of the other crap that runs around, but that's about it. <laughs> now I know that there is some disagreement on this. And I know that the main disagreement will come from Philip. <laughs> so, Philip, hear you. Yeah, thank you, Hans. Uh, the points are well, well taken. Um, let me give you a disclaimer first. I know, I know Millet uh, personally. I consider him a friend. Um, I met him first in person 2021 when we had lunch together and you know this feeling that you have here also that uh, yeah, the, the other person is, uh, has read Hopper, Rothbard, Mises is an anarcho-capitalist, sees the state as the, ult as, as the ultimate enemy and the texts are theft and so on. So I got immediately the impression that he was one of us to say say this way, um, and the conversation was as friendly as is with anyone would would be here. That is the first time I I met them, and uh, so so I trust that he is an anarcho-capitalist, not only self-proclaimed, but he but he really is. Um, he has the best intentions, I think. Um, Well, there are the, 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 the different, different things I would like to, to point out about what uh, Hans said. Um, there, of course, always the problem of corruption. Actually, the first time I met him, I asked him, don't you fear that when you go into politics, you will be corrupted and get away from the principles? Yeah? So I asked him that because I think this is the, the biggest danger that uh, could, could happen. I think that he does a really great job in spreading the ideas of liberty. So I don't think it goes into one ear and out of the other, and I don't think it's only misery that uh, brought him to power. He started in 2014 or 15, going to television, and become very quickly a star. Uh, in 2018, he was already one of the 100 most uh, famous um, people in Argentina, and he was with, with a large difference the uh, economist who got most air time in television. And during all these years, he has done what he calls uh, Batalla Cultural, which is spreading the ideas, to spread the ideas to, of liberty to, to the population. And I think there has been a change in mentality in Argentina. Yeah, while the Jews, especially the Jews, they, the young people, they were, of course, before they were all very leftist. And now in, he got most votes about the, uh, with the young people. And these people actually buy Austrian books. Like uh, the, in, in Spanish, the books of Union Editorial, which is the main publishing house of Austrian books, they are sold out all, all the time. So there's a huge movement. Um, building in, in Argentina a libertarian movement and they are reading your books, they are reading Rothbard's books, they are reading Mises, what is Soto, and they are very well educated in libertarian ideas. They are 14-year-old people who, who uh, 
by memory recite the definition of liberalism that uh, Millet gives, um, because he repeats it all over again. And they, and they read this. And now he gets the platform in Davos and at other places. And it, I, think, I don't think it's about the elites. Uh, they, they, they don't care. But this platform now is a global platform for libertarian ideas. And he always cites, also in these speeches, with have, have a global impact, uh, the li libertarian authors, yeah? Mises, Hayek, uh, Rothbard, Walter de Soto, uh, um, Alberto Benegas Lynch. So I think uh, a libertarian politician, which at the end is a politician, um, one should measure him first, or what he should do is to spread the ideas in the most poor form. He should have very clear the idea where to go, and I think he has it clear. And he defends it. Also, after he was elected, he still calls uh, the state a parasite or politicians parasites. So this is one thing to have, uh, in theory, the idea is clear, the, to have the ideas. The ideal is anarcho-capitalism and it's there. And then in practice, of course, you have to make compromises. I mean, Millet is unfortunately, oh, <laughs> he's not a dictator who can do anything he wants. He has no majority in parliament, nor in the Senate. He has only 15% in the parliament. Yes. So he needed allies. Uh, and, and there he took, of course, uh, people that also know how the machine of the state works, that were ministers before, like Caputo or Sturz, uh, Sturzenegger, who was the head of the central bank before. And um, he, he needed, or he needs their support, at least until the next election, of the pa uh, parliament next year uh, to get things done. Otherwise, he, he cannot get uh, anything, anything done. He, so, so he is one anarcho-capitalist, but the people he, he works with and he needs their support, they are maybe monetarist or Chicago school people, um, and he tries to push them in, in the right direction. I think everything he did oh, is in the right direction, and this is an important thing. One, ha one can criticize him for not doing enough and not doing it fast enough. And this is very well taken, and one should push him to do things faster. And it's, of course, very difficult to know how fast can someone go without uh, leaving the support, uh, 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 losing the support. Does he have to dance in the street with Nipple? Yeah, yeah, well, I, I can't... I, I can't... <laughs> Let, let me go through the three uh, parts. So internal th stuff, he cut real government spending by, by there are several estimates, by the, the highest is 35%. So he got rid of, totally rid of the inflation tax, which was, there, there was a deficit of 5% of, 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 uh, of the government and 10% as the central bank, because the central bank was also indebting itself, so 15% was financed by printing new money last year, and he got it down to, until July to zero. At the same time, yes, he raised some taxes, uh, like the import tax, as you pointed out, but the net effect is that a huge reduction of taxes, which you can see uh, the burden of the government on the shoulders of the people has fallen because the real government spending has fallen uh, 35%. And about the central bank and the repudiation of debt, I mean, I, I, I'm very favorable to that. And I actually asked him why he, uh, why he would not have done that. Like, uh, uh, I mean, if you close the central bank, you have also the problem that the central bank has issued the debts to the banks that the banks bought, so you would have the collapse of the banking system as well, something I'm favorable to as well. But uh, he said that if I would have done that, there would have been hyperflation, of course, um, and I would have been out of office in three days. So he has not only has to work with people which are not libertarians, but he has also the opposition who wants everything, the left, wants everything to, to make every, does everything that he has, isn't successful, because if he is successful, the left will not go back to power in Argentina anytime soon. <laughs> Yeah. And in the rest of the world, it would be also an example that libertarian ideas work and therefore the left all over the world wants him to fail. 
urgently. So they will steer social unrest and a coup whenever it's possible. And if there's a hyperinflation, they will certainly, they will certainly do it and maybe be successful. And then the Kirchnerists just come back into power and uh, it will be a total misery for, for Argentina. And this is also the reason for the IMF, that um, if the IMF does not renew the debt next year, um, there will be default in, in, Argentina, in Argentina and possibly hyperinflation. So, and there might be maybe social unrest and he may get lose power. Um, but there would be no hyperinflation if he just simply st stops repaying the debt. That has nothing to do with hyperinflation. Well, then the whole he banking system can go, could go uh, bankrupt, and then why would you have uh, faith in the peso anymore? They, they, they would switch maybe to the dollar and then stop using the peso, and the peso would use, lose its, yeah, its the value. Yeah, peso, peso would disappear. That's good. Yeah, yeah, that's good, but it would uh, hyperinflation in terms of pesos, so the peso would become worthless. Yeah. Um, no, then people go, use dollars instead of pesos. Peso dies out, and they use dollars. Then they are only dependent on on on, on the dollar inflation, and that can be uh, uh, accommodated by also allowing euro payment of taxes or gold payment in, in taxes. So there would be no hyperinflation. They would just use dollars. That's it. Yeah, the, the question is if you could do that without uh, having social unrest that would le lead to a loose of support of people which he, which he, he needs. Did not, he did not make an attempt to close the central bank as he promised he would. He did, that, he, he might have had, uh, might have needed the uh, um, agreement from Parliament, but he didn't even try. He didn't even say, "Look, I'm proposing that we close the central bank, and there will be no more pesos printed from to this day on." He could have said that. He yeah. didn't say it. You know, I, I tell you what what his plan was. His pl plan was initially to take the assets of the central bank. Uh, which uh, go, uh, Argentinian government bonds, switch them into dollars, and then exchange the monetary base of pesos into, into dollars. When he assumed power, he looked, at the, oh, he looked at the central bank's balance sheet and found out there are not enough, uh, enough assets to turn into dollars. The central bank has issued even remunerated liabilities that uh, lead to an internal um, need to produce more pesos because the central bank issued basically short-term liabilities at an interest rate of more than 100 percent and they issued pesos to to pay these these interests so he said i first want to um, clean up the central bank's balance sheet all these problems i want to s uh, solve first and then he's, he still wants to get rid of the central bank uh, not immediately, because I asked him, do you still want to get rid of it? And he says, yes. I'm also occupied, preoccupied that it takes, I'm worried that it takes so long. And of course, this president of the central bank who is, uh, who is a monetarist, he doesn't want to close the central bank. That's, that's, that's very clear. But I still think that he wants to do so. And he says always that once the inflation rate uh, comes, comes down to zero, then he will open also the exchange rate, yeah, and then the time will come to get rid of the central bank. <laughs> that's, that's, that sounds a little bit like the announcements that you have from the Turkish central bank. By, by, by 2029, they get the inflation rate down to the point where they want to have it. And his, his plan is also, whenever the inflation rate is down, but he has already projections in 2026, it should be that, in 2027, it should be that. And that, of course, instills great trust in the public uh, about the solidity of the, central, of the central bank. These types of promises are always delivered by central banks. That's what they are there for. They lie about what they do with money. That's it. And I, I totally agree that we have to push Millet 
to do it as fast as possible. And I also, I, I totally agree with you with that. Should be, but I think he's going to, into the right direction. It could, could be done faster, of course. Le so let's, le it, it, maybe Aless Alessandro is also an expert on Argentina. He has been there, he also speaks Spanish. So he knows certain things that I don't know. <laughs> so please, Alessandro. <laughs> Uh, yes, that's true. I uh, have been visiting Argentina for a long time, I think well, almost 20 years. I was there lots of times and sometimes you get interesting conversations. I, I like to talk to taxi drivers who usually have a very good feel about what is what is going on. And, uh, okay, some, some remarks um, about Anthony Muller's speech. Uh, what I would say, you can take the, the exchange rate for the, of the 322 uh, pesos for a dollar because this was a regulated exchange rate. Uh, I was there in March and I had the feeling that the exchange rate between dollar and peso wasn't moving that much. And so you should take the next figure, which is, was uh, 790, close to 800, and then it didn't move that much during during that time. So this is one of the things that happened. But um, when I last visited Argentina in March, I had a very interesting conversation with uh, local libertarians. Argentina has a strong libertarian tradition, of course, a minority like we are in all the rest of the world, but there are uh, libertarians. And uh, what they said is, and what is strange about Millet, so I agree with, uh, there are some good indicators. There are there's the inflation which went down. There are some intelligent things that he did do. And I agree with Hans, he's better than, than most other politicians. So there are some, some good sides. But what they told me is, first, he does not really belong to the to the Argentinian libertarian community. He he never was really there. He's a latecomer to to the libertarian economy and and Austrian school economy and libertarian philosophy. He was for a long time a mathematical economist. He's in fact a, an expert on Keynes. He wrote a very interesting book which is uh, entitled uh, how to mm, uh, show the, the lies of the Keynesians, Desenmascarando la mentira keynesiana, a good book, uh, but still he comes from a completely different cultural uh, I, uh, set. What the uh, Argentinian lib libertarians told me, why isn't he getting some of us on board? There are lots of people who could contribute to what he is trying to do. So this sounds a little bit strange, and if you look at people like Caputo or Sturzenegger, you feel a little bit strange about what is going on in, in Argentina. Uh, further, um, I, I agree with Hans, uh, most Argentinians don't understand anything about what he is telling, and I see a fundamental risk. Uh, we call us libertarians and anarcho-capitalists by now, but as Murray Rothbard pointed out, we lost our names because our name because in the 18th century uh, we were called the liberals. The liberals were the radicals, were the ones who wanted to establish unrestricted personal individual freedom, who were going in the direction of abolishing states. This is just an evolution of, of liberal thought during the, the, the later years. But we lost our name because what a liberal is now in, in America, I would say a Marxist communist, this is what they call themselves, and also in the rest of the world, people calling themselves liberals are just another brand of, of socialism. Uh, for example, in Italy, uh, there are some liberal think tanks who are 
Not at all liberal. They are they are just a different brand of socialists. They want to have a little less state, but still lots of state, lots of taxation. They think that state intervention in the economy is necessary. There's no other way. So we lost our name and we had to call us libertarians, uh, uh, anarcho-capitalists or whatever. I see the risk that uh, a potential failure of Millet could cause the, the, another loss of our name. Because if you look also in mainstream media, uh, the, the word anarcho-capitalist and libertarian is now widespread. I read a post a few, a few weeks ago where none other than Bill Gates was defined as an anarcho-capitalist. So, <laughs> no, it's true. <laughs> it's true. So uh, I see a risk. I see a risk that the, the name gets watered down. Uh, Hans told us at the beginning of the conference, this conference is about radical inter intellectual uh, about uncompromising radi radicalism intellectual radicalism this is what we are uh, the name changes so there there are lots of people talking about libertarians and it seems like the policies of Millet are libertarian i'm not 100% convinced that they are libertarian. They go in the right direction. I'd rather have lower inflation than high inflation. But still, is this the way to go? Further, uh, although Millet, at, at the beginning, he claimed to be a 100% libertarian anarcho-capitalist, and especially if you hear and read what he wrote before he was elected president, it was very good completely in our tradition, no, no question about that. And this was also his electoral program. Uh, but then you have to ask yourself, uh, it is quite clear that the president of Argentina is in a situation where he is blackmailed. He is blackmailed by the United States, he is blackmailed by the International Monetary Fund. What I read about the gold transfer is that one of the reasons is Sooner or later, the Argentina will need to restructure its debt, its foreign debt, and one of the ways to do it is to offer the gold in, as collateral. Supposedly, the gold is in, 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 gray, in, in London, and probably this will be used to do some sort of, of, uh, of restructuring of the debt. Would you put yourself in a situation to be blackmailed, especially by the International Monetary Fund? I don't know. Uh, but even if you, you think that this is the best way, that you are the only hope to get Argentina, maybe not in, as, a, as a libertarian country, but in the direction of libertarianism, uh, why be so enthusiastic? You could say, okay, you could let people understand that you are blackmailed, that you have no other choice than saying yes to the USA, yes to Israel. But... The, the messages he sends, they are a little bit strange. Uh, could you say there are, no, in, an, in an interview, I think, with the BBC, he said there, are, there is no proof that Israel is committing war crimes in Gaza. How, how could you say that? Uh, the, the, you, you just have to open X, uh, former Twitter, to find hundreds and, and tens of proofs of what is going on there. So... Again, why would you dance in the streets with Netanyahu? Why would you say that you are in favor of the United States regardless of who is elected? This is, he said recently, even if Kamala Harris is elected, I am an ally of the United States. You could have shown to your people and to the people of the world, I am under duress, I am in blackmail and I cannot do otherwise. On the other side, there are lots of people who say, yes, Argentina uh, is not joining the BRICS, the, the Russian alliance. This is exactly as bad as the United States. So this wouldn't make sense either. But a policy of more neutrality, even if you have to deal with the, with the International Monetary Fund, could be, could be the way. Last remark about dollarization, there has been, have been experiments in dollarization, especially in South America, and what the authors say, there is a very interesting book about uh, dollarization in Argentina, 
which was published a few months before, before uh, Millet was elected. Uh, what the authors agree about is the sooner the better, because if you keep the promise of dollarization and meanwhile you keep your, your old currency and you keep going on with inflationary policies or maybe less inflationary policies, but still with this, uh, with this currency, uh, you, you ruin the, the path to dollarization. In fact, in other countries, I think like Colombia, it was done very fast uh, to dollarize the economy. Last but not least, he has not that much power. That is quite clear. He has 15% of the parliament. The Senate is against him. Uh, the first project of his uh, Ley de Bases y Puntos, which is a direct reference to the liberal tradition of, of Argentina, uh, was much more radical than the, the final text that was approved by the by the. Uh, uh, Congress first and by the Parliament later. So it is quite clear that he has to uh, strike some compromises. Uh, but I don't know if, does, if this does make so much sense. Uh, for example, in the first draft of the law, uh, it was um, he had an extensive program of privatizations. Uh, nonetheless, the law was very unclear. How are you going to privatize the, the companies? Uh, it seems that the, 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 the path will be that of selling the companies to, uh, to some so-called private entrepreneur. This is, in my opinion, and Rothbard wrote a lot about this uh, after the, the, the falling down of the, the Soviet Union. This is exactly the wrong a way to privatize a uh, public company because uh, public companies are the result of theft. They are financed either by taxation or expropriation and so the, the owners and the people have been expropriated and stolen uh, and, and, and robbed. Uh, then the state uses the company for a certain amount of time. Again, uh, often with uh, with uh, theft of the of the th taxes, and if then the company is sold to a so-called private entrepreneur, which is a friend of the government, and the government cashes the the the, the payment for the company, the citizenship is is robbed again, a second time by the government. What should you do? You should give back the companies to the people, if it's possible. Sometimes it's hard. Uh, Rothbard made some remarks, you cannot uh, give one million shares or 10 million shares or whatever to the people. But still, you could split the companies. We have these giant companies which exist only because concentration and monopoly is, is good for the government. You can spl could split the companies. Or you could give the companies back to the workers. This was what he originally said about Aerolinas Argentinas. Uh, so, as it seems to be, there is the, the risk that the blackmailing by the monetary fund, the blackmailing by the United States, the sale, prospective sale of, of uh, Argentinian companies to the the, 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 the small club of BlackRock and uh, dominated companies who are the, 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 the financial is expression of the US dominance on the world will create a situation where uh, simply they will buy up Argentina. And this I see as a big risk. I don't think that this, these are the intentions of Millet, at least if he is he's, uh, sincere. Uh, he said completely different things, but the risk is that, willing or not, he will be pushed in this direction. Last remark, I have spoken already a lot. Uh, we are convinced that politicians are crooks and liars. So, uh, Millet is a politician, so there are two possibilities. Either he is a liar, like any other politician, and so he simply used the appeal of libertarian ideas to be elected. And it worked out because he was elected. Uh, or he is the, uh, 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 a one-time case in history, 
which he claims to be. So he is not a liar. He said the truth. He said, I am willing to destroy the state. He, he uses this expression, dinamitar el Estado. It means blowing up the state with, uh, with dynamite, not, not only smashing the state, as, as uh, David told us. It's a really violent image of what he wants to do with the state. If he is... He is trying something unprecedented in history. So, someone who, who destroys the state from within. Is it possible? This is the great question. Uh, could you be, uh, the, uh, could you be the, the, a mafia boss of the mob to uh, get away with the mob during, during the next year? So, I want to fight the mob, I want to fight the mafia, and that's why I'm the, the current Don Corleone. I don't know if it's, if it's, uh, if it's doable. But, on the other hand, we have to be honest. We anarchists, we libertarians, we didn't achieve much during the year in, in terms of, of uh, destruction of the states, in terms of, of, uh, um, of, of going at least in the direction. The, the world is going more and more in a socialist direction and recently more and more in the direction of war, which I agree with Hans is the worst possible thing. It's the worst possible crime of a state, way, uh, way worse than, than simply taxation, regulation, and so on. So let's watch what happens. Let's see if he is a politician like any other, and so he was lying, or if he is a unique case in history. We will see in the next years. So I want to give David to make some, uh, create some peace. <laughs> there are peaceful anarchists, obviously. So uh, I think uh, anarchists have a tendency to peace. No, actually, a, a question that comes uh, to me now during this discussion is these shortcomings that are there, of course, every uh, political program uh, or the realizations of programs have their shortcomings. Are they based on, you know, um, principal defaults or principal mistakes in that policy, or are they just shortcomings that maybe can be, you know, um, made better in, in next uh, um, in next phases? Are they perhaps concessions just to political conditions that are there? For instance, this um, enforcement of, of the military forces, these things, is it just a concession because military is that dangerous in South America as an ultimate instance to, to intervene, you know? Um, so are these... Are these um, practical or um, tactical concessions or mistakes or are these fundamental problems this is this is what, what i would be interested in and of course the the visions how it will be the development depends on this can, can this be i mean philip can, can you uh, estimation on, on this question yeah, I think these are, as you can imagine, I think it's uh, tactical concessions, also the military. He, he has the minister of the military is from the pro party, which he needs for support. His uh, vice president is a daughter of a high military rank officers and he got uh, important votes to win the election from this, uh, from this part of the population. So if he, uh, he gets the support of, of, of the military, which is very important, as you said, in South, South, South America. So, um, um, as I said, I had the same doubts as, as, as you had, Alessandro. Is, is he just lying or not? And, and I tried to find out when I met him the first time, and I came to the personal conclusion that I might be wrong, that it's the se second case, it's a, it's a unique case. But uh, I may be wrong, but I, I think one should... Uh, one can and should criticize him where he does stuff uh, that go in the wrong direction on uh, it's not fast enough and I think in the and I agree of course in the external policy it's the most glaring even though I don't think the practical implications of this 
are very important. Um, that he pays lip service to say, yeah, I support the West against Russia and the, these people. Um, I don't think this has practical, important implications for Argentina, because Argentina is on the global perspective of military wars, and so it's uh, non-existent, or it's uh, irrelevant, totally irrelevant. So, um, so I don't think that is, uh, that, that is crucial. This question, but I agree that it would be better to be neutral, even though I think it could be. Uh, so, so in South America, the option is or you are with the BRICS, so with Russia, China, Iran, or you're with the United States. I don't see it so clearly as you that there's strictly an option to be neutral, especially if there's blackmailing by the IMF or, and so on. No, that I cannot quite agree with here. As far as foreign policy is concerned, he was completely free. Uh, he could say whatever he wanted, and he could stay, take an, a neutral stand. And he did side with gangsters all around the world. That was a big mistake, and that will ruin the reputation of libertarianism all over, the, all, all over South America. They will just say the same things that they said, oh, Friedman was a guy who advised Pinochet, and because of that, these libertarians are evil people. He pursues now the same, the same policy. Needing the support of the military is one thing, but assigning the military also to do domestic things, police tasks, is something entirely different that did not exist before under any other regime. So, no. Foreign policy is very important, and you cannot say, oh, this is a, 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 for internal affairs in Argentina, that doesn't matter much, and nobody in the world uh, cares much about it. foreign policy that Argentina pursues. No, for the world, the perception of libertarians changes fundamentally if they see a guy who declares himself to be an anarcho-capitalist, a libertarian, is supporting the United States in all of its wars and troubles that it causes all over the world, and supports a guy like uh, Netanyahu, who is, at least in the current scene, the biggest mass murderer that runs around. That will ruin the reputation of libertarianism the world around. So we should make it perfectly clear that we distance ourselves from this type of policy. Whatever he does in Argentina might be better than what other people before him did. But this sort of thing is an unforgivable mistake that he made. And with that, I declare that over. <laughs>